In this tutorial, we're going to deal with the Output Manager and the options available to you and how to use it. In order to use the Output Manager, you have to select Gears or a gear on the screen. I've loaded a simple project here of a fake planetary gear, and we'll put out some output for this thing. Now, you have a choice of right-clicking at the root of your um, project database window. We'll give you a selection of Select All, and when you do that, all of the gears become selected. You can see they're blue in the tab. And if we push Output Manager, they'll all be listed as gears to be processed under its window selected gears. This wouldn't make sense in, the, make sense in this particular project, though, because we're running a planetary gear, and five of the gears are identical. So it may make more sense to simply uh, click on the gear that you're interested in, or if you're interested in multiples, hold down the Control key and hit another gear. Now we have two gears selected and when we go to the output manager we're only dealing with the two. Output can take quite a while uh, under gearotic motion. It depends on what kind of output you're asking for. The slowest output is 2.5D milling. Um, the 2.5D milling has to compute proper offsets, proper uh, tool runs, taking into account the diameter of the tool and such and it takes a little while to process all that and put it out properly. It has the uh, ability as well to change some of the motions into arcs and to round off the ends of the teeth. Uh, but let's take a look at how we do this. You can see at the top of the screen we have our sample project name. If it says untitled, now's the time to change the project name. You will be asked once more uh, when you go to do the output uh, to change the name if it is untitled. In this case, it's sample project, so we can leave it alone. Uh, we're selected on our first gear, involute number one. And what we can see on the right-hand side of the screen are basically all the options that you could have for that gear. Uh, for example, we could check 2D DXF, 3D DXF, 3D STL. The 2D DXF is a DXF of the uh, drawing in 2D of all those gears. They'll be accurate to size and a lot of uh, CAM programs will have no trouble with them. VCarve in particular does a wonderful job in uh, generating toolpaths for them. LazyCam will also load 2D DXFs. 3D DXFs are probably not very useful. They're useful perhaps to someone who's making a simulation of their own in another type of CAD program or maybe they need a 3D object of a gear for something else that they're dealing with in programming land out there. 3D STLs are used by uh, 3D printers and these gears can be used for that but I would add the caution that um, gears with a lot of teeth and gears that are very large uh, will lose a fair amount of resolution. In order to keep the program fairly quick um, resolution will suffer as you increase the size of the gear. Small gears and such you'll have the same resolution basically that a DXF file has. One-to-one -one scale printing prints out a gear onto one or multiple sheets of paper. Um, it also prints a legend at the top of each page to show you where in the matrix each page fits so that you can, for example, glue 12 pieces of paper together uh, so that they line up and stick them on a piece of wood to cut them with a scroll saw. This is a very common way for cutting gears for people that aren't into CNC and uh, are making clocks and so on. They do amazingly good work with it as well, so I included it as an option. Uh, 2.5D milling. This is where it will put out a tap file for uh, cutting the gear. It does it in the correct order, cutting the shaft first, the spokes second, and the gear third. And in the NC parameters is where you'll set your tool diameter that you intend to cut this with, your final depth of cut, how thick you want to cut the gear through, spindle speed, tool number, the amount of cut per pass, that's a positive number and just means in this case cut four millimeters down on each pass starting at zero. Safe Z height is the height that the tool will lift up to when it moves between the various elements of the gear. Feed rate of course, Plunge rate is the rate at which the tool will drop into the material, and a step over percentage is really only used in the case of fourth axis code, and I'll explain that in a moment. The checkbox for rounded corners 
um, tells the algorithm to try to find an arc to fit any uh, lines that are appropriate to be arced and it does tend to round off the ends of the teeth slightly which can be beneficial in a lot of situations then we have fourth axis code fourth axis code can be put out for um, spur gears and for helical gears in its selections you'll select whether your rotary table is parallel to the x-axis or the y-axis and you'll also specify whether the chuck is in a plus direction this differentiates for example between a, uh, a rotary index table that's placed on the left hand side or right hand side of uh, of your table on the x-axis general rule to a rotary table is that when an when a rotary table turns clockwise, the piece which is in its chucks should turn counterclockwise when viewed from the plus direction of its parallel axis. So in this case, if we mount an indexer table onto our x axis, looking at it from the plus side of the x, when the angle is positive, the piece should turn counterclockwise. If you mount it on the left, of or on the right hand side of your table you would reverse the direction of the a-axis so that the piece still rotates in a counterclockwise direction and in that case you'll check this box which says chuck in plus direction um, so that your zeroing of the blanks is proper evolute segmentation is how finely you wish to shave the teeth on the fourth axis system uh, to get a very accurate uh, evolute angle uh, curve We've found through experimentation that the difference between 10 and 8 is almost negligible. Um, you probably never have to go above 10. The evolute curve is very smooth and no sanding is required when you use this uh, fourth axis method. You have a selection for use involute cutter. This is in case you have a cutter which is the exact size of the teeth you're going to cut on this particular gear. It would certainly speed up the cutting of the gear and uh, because you don't need to do the type of tangential shaving that we do in normal fourth axis work we have this selection so you're basically turning off special processing and simply have the rotary axis cut the gear um, one tooth at a time using the proper pass per depth so that your involute cutter uh, makes all the curves necessary we also have one here called convert helical to knuckle if you check on the form you'll find what we call a knuckle gear uh, basically, it's a spur gear where the teeth are turned into uh, almost like round bearings so that the tooth, the teeth automatically pull to center. Um, it's one of those gears that cannot be cut without a CNC system, and I threw it in because it was interesting and it looks kind of artistic. Um, a few words on the fourth axes. We do this a little strangely to how a person would expect a gear to be cut. Because we know the evolute mathematics of each gear that you're trying to cut, it's possible to use a straight fluted tool bit, and you're told on the screen what size tool bit is the maximum that you can use, uh, to go down into the root and do a clearance. Once it clears out the part of the root which can be erased, it then starts to move laterally while the uh, helical angle is applied, and this allows us to basically shave the teeth in a series of steps, in this case in 10 steps, to come up with a very smooth tooth form. Uh, there are videos on YouTube and on the form that show you the theory behind this. It works exceptionally well and it works not only with helicals but with ordinary spur gears. So, And it's the only way really to cut a spur gear thick. If you have a 3 inch thick spur gear and you're cutting it with a 3 millimeter bit, it would be very hard to do in 2.5D. Uh, one final word is that the two and a half, or the fourth axis code will use the settings from the two and a half D where appropriate. For example, final cut depth is immaterial to a fourth axis code. The fourth axis code knows that the final cut depth is the dedendum of the tooth. So when generating fourth axis code, it's pretty much all done for you automatically. The rule here is that you zero your tool on top of the blank, just outside the blank, at the position furthest from the chuck. This direction is put inside each g-code file as well uh, to remind you exactly how to zero and what size cutter that you told it it's going to use. Cutter size is very important in fourth axis cutting. Make sure that you're entering 
3.2 millimeters for a tool diameter if indeed the tool is 3.2. A lot of us would use, for example, a 3 millimeter, uh, what we call a 3 millimeter tool when it's actually the standard equivalent, which comes out to about 3.2 millimeters. So measure your tools when you're doing fourth axis code, and if you do, you'll find that your gears mesh very nicely together. There's examples of gears that are cut on the fourth axis. Um, as well as on the uh, 2.5D uh, cutting on the website uh, in the form, so I'd encourage you to join into the form and take a look. Uh, the 1 to 1 scale printing is uh, very accurate. It is done on a, uh, I print them on my laser printer, and they're a good diagnostic tool even if they're not how you intend to cut. Uh, what I do is I will cut my gear on the uh, CNC system either in two and a half or in fourth axis and then I'll come in here and print the same gear on my laser printer and I'll know I have a good gear if I drop it on top of the paper and the two images line up nicely so it makes a very good diagnostic tool for you to see uh, just how well your system's cutting and if you screwed up anything on the fourth axis code in terms of tool size etc. Now once I check the options that I want I'm going to check fourth axis as well uh, for this involute gear number one. If I go to involute number three, you can see everything is unchecked. If I go back to involute number one, they're checked. Um, what I'm showing you here is that each gear is individually selectable for what options you want. You may not, for example, want to tell some of your gears to put out as fourth axis and some you may want to do fourth axis. So it allows you to turn on and off and even change the tool parameters and so on for each type of gear. Uh, if you are, have selected everything for the one gear and you want to do it on all gears, just hit copy to all gears. And now if we go to Influt 3, we'll see that we have the same settings. Now when you push the output button, a folder will be created off of the root folder of Gerotica under the project name and inside that folder will be one of each of these files. They will be named according to the gear names that are showing up here so we'll end up with like involute 1 2D DXF, involute 1 3D dot DXF, uh, right down to the fourth axis code which would be involute 1 dash fourth dot tap and if you selected 2.5D code you would get involute 1 dot tap. That's all you really need to know about the Output Manager, other than the fact that it can be slow. Again, we're going to only do two gears here, and I'm going to hit Output. And if you watch the bar at the top of the screen, you'll see we've got a warning saying, Be patient, this may take a while. And a progress bar begins to periodically flash at the top of the screen for each gear. But as you can see, there are times when there's just total inactivity. The bar at the top of the screen at the moment is uh, sitting there kind of blank, and we're waiting. Now this is taking a little longer than normal because I'm running Camtasia at the same time, but now you can see that the bar graph has come back, is uh, filling in and back and flashing about. When it's finished, the output manager will disappear. But the point is here, it can take a while, so design your project, get happy with them, select all your output options, say go, and go have a cup of coffee. So there we go. Those two outputs with all those files just took us about 30 seconds. Well, that's it for Output Manager. Um, that's all you really need to know to use it. Uh, see you in the next tutorial.